Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello again, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Celebrating Act 2. As you can see, my good buddy Art Kirsch and I are with the fabulous Dr. Liz Lister. Liz, great to see you again. Likewise. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Liz, I have something which is uh, sometimes we're upbeat, some kind of, kind of light, uh, but it seems that, um, uh, and I having served in the military, I'm fairly familiar with the subject matter uh, of PTSD. In fact, I even uh, about 15 years ago did a short on it based on a, uh, a survivor of Iwo Jima. Uh, mm -hmm. But putting that aside, PTSD is something used to be associated pretty much with the military where it became a popular acronym, post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, stress disorder. But um, uh, now, every week we seem to have a mass shooting someplace. And I'm just talking about America, but I know it's a worldwide uh, situation, PTSD. Can you talk to our audience and help them understand what PTSD basically is, how they might be able to recognize it in themselves and others, and perhaps uh, that they can seek treatment because it's not the person's fault, it's their environment that that happened around them. So yeah. if, you, I, if you wouldn't mind, right. uh, could you uh, talk to that, uh, to our audience? Sure, absolutely. Well, as you mentioned, it is becoming more common. Uh, estimates are between three and a half to about 6% of the American adult population. So that is several million American adults who suffer from PTSD. And the definition of the psychiatric disorder, the post-traumatic stress disorder, is the presence or that they've witnessed or experienced. Okay, so they may have gone through it themselves or just been there and witnessed it, a traumatic event. It could be a, a natural disaster. It could be a, an accident. It could be a terrorist attack. It could be war and combat. That's the situation, as you mentioned, that we know the that we know the longest, that we've been aware of the longest. Uh, it could be rape or other types of uh, that type of life threat. Uh, it could be sexual violence. It could be a bad injury. There's really a lot of uh, a, a long list of different scenarios that can lead to PTSD. And usually the technical definition requires that something like that has happened. I personally think that you could expand that definition even further uh, so that people have sort of lower grade uh, levels of PTSD. But it's worthwhile sticking to kind of the major uh, level, the, the, the higher level where it's more severe and more well known. So the, that definition includes that type of life-threatening event, either witnessing or experiencing it. It could be then that you get internal reminders more than a month out from that event, right? Mm. So memories, flashbacks, images, right? Everyone's going to have that, but if someone's able to process it quickly, then they may not end up with PTSD. But if they're getting those types of inter internal reminders more than a month out, that's on its way to being diagnosed P PTSD. So that's mm -hmm. the internal, kind of the brain level. And then there's the external reminders. So people might go out of their way to avoid certain situations. Uh, if children become withdrawn, for example, yeah. that's an example or somebody completely changing their life uh, because of an incident that happened, that's going to be more related to the onset of PTSD, right? Rather than really being able to process it. And then the other couple of criteria are a, a change in the level of anxiety. Now, this is really hard to tell nowadays. We have so much going on. As you mentioned, I mean, there's there are mass shootings every week in the United States, which really is disproportionate to the rest of the world. There's no there's no denying that. And we definitely need to fix that. Uh, but for right now, we're talking about the, the anxiety. The pandemic has sort of raised everybody's level of overall anxiety. But PTSD definitely has that aspect. 
of an altered anxiety state. And then also for in terms of criteria for diagnosing PTSD is a change in mood or a change in the way of thinking. Again, a lot of overlap in everything that we're talking about, but it has to persist over time, at least at least a month, but usually it's persisting a lot longer when people get diagnosed with PTSD. Okay, so if I might ask, so uh, let's say that uh, you noticed, um, uh, now obviously when you have a mass shooting and things like that, particularly in schools, uh, you hear, and we're going to be sending in grieving counselors and things like that. So right. those are people who can help uh, diagnose right. those kind of things. But let's say that uh, somebody had an auto accident or they uh, they were worried about um, uh, losing their parents uh, for some reason. You have these mood changes. Is the What's the right thing to direct either if you're aware of it yourself or if you see it in somebody else, how can they get help? Because this doesn't sound like the thing that the normal family physician uh, is trained in. Knowing. Where do they go for help so that they don't fall off the deep end? Right. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that question. Of course, the family doctor can be of help. Then also a therapist, especially therapists who do what is now being referred to as somatic therapy. We could talk about that another time. We'll we'll do a, another video about those types of treatments. But the purpose of those treatments, and not all therapists are trained in these techniques. So for example, there's a technique called EMDR. All right, EMDR, that one is really worth noting because it really is helpful. It's been shown to integrate the brain with the body. All right, it's done in a lot of different ways. It stands for Eye Movement Deprogramming Reprocessing. That's what EMDR stands for because originally you had to look back and forth, back and forth. It was an eye movement technique. However, there's a lot of different ways to do it now. Uh, it's very interesting. I've had that done myself. It was. I just think it's very, very useful. You know, there's a limit to how much talking about a traumatic experience is going to help someone process that experience, mm -hmm. you know? And I wanna to add to your list, Art, uh, because I experienced this in my practice, I encountered this in my practice, is women who had very traumatic childbirth experiences. Mm, wow. Suddenly rushed to the operating room for a C-section, suddenly something wrong with the baby, or maybe even the birth goes okay, but then there's something going on with the baby. So there can be trauma around these types of events, and it gets underestimated. Because Is this something that was uh, may have been referred to as postpartum depression? Is that part of that world? No, different, different. Oh, no, I'm oh, talking really? about women experiencing PTSD related to traumatic oh. birth experiences. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just putting it in that, I shouldn't say just, putting it in that category of those types of very frightening experiences. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Liz, I'm assuming, uh, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming that you can have various levels of PTSD um, and of course, a milder thing might be harder to, to diagnose. And I want to give you a quick story. At 9-11, uh, during 9-11, my business partner, then business partner and friend was in New York. Mm. And he, uh, his mother was 80 years old, lived here in California. He was on business, uh, called and tried to get out of, couldn't get out of the city because everything was shut down for two or three days. Right, but came right. back, and his mother, 80-year-old mother in Kansas City, I think now, as we talk about it, I think was experiencing PTSD because it was constantly on the television. Her son had been there, mm -hmm. even though he had called, and I'm safe, and I'm uptown, and that's downtown, and all of those mitigating circumstances didn't matter. She was filled with anxiety for months. Terrified. And finally, uh, uh, not much long after, he said to her, Ma, turn off the television. Right, mm. that's right. You know, it, you're, you're, it's all over, you can't escape it. You're, it's constantly bombarding you and you don't need that and I'm okay. Yes, um, and indeed. She, it didn't matter that he was okay. She was that's right. filled with anxiety. So my interpretation, of course, as a layman is that 
years later, she probably had PTSD. D does that sound yeah. like a possibility? It does. It absolutely does. Because again, let's talk about PTSD. It's a combination. It's a brain and body disorder. It's a brain mm -hmm. and body problem. So she was watching all this news. That's all this input coming into her brain. She is worried. She's very frightened, right? So we've got that criteria of that super scary experience, which of course that was for all of us to different yeah. degrees, obviously. Sure. So I totally agree. There's no question for me that that type of level of fear can then lead to PTSD. Yeah. Uh, be, before before uh, 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 we finish this uh, topic, uh, because we could go on for hours, and there yes. there are just so many things that we can talk about. Uh, if you uh, because I believe this to be true, and you can verify it or not, that people who are either experiencing these kinds of things or think they are, or if they notice somebody who does, that it's not their fault. And that for most people, not everybody, but for most people, it can either be alleviated or uh, reduced to the point where you can actually uh, live with it or even cure it. So are those things true? And coming, can you tell us is, is, uh, if somebody recognizes it, that they shouldn't lose hope? Absolutely. That's absolutely correct. In some cases, the symptoms can just alleviate over time and time is going to help really heal. Therapists, especially therapists who are able to do those types of somatic, that's the, that's the thing to look up, somatic therapies or to ask when you're looking around for a therapist who would be able to help with this. And then psychiatrists, of course, also help from the medication standpoint. Uh, a lot can be done and that really depends on what the person is uh, experiencing and the degree of the trauma that they lived through. I think that it's really important. Ultimately, I think the common thread in terms of people getting better over time is being able to process the physical aspect of PTSD, not just thinking through it mentally, but understanding that the body and the mind are not separate. We can talk about that also. We can go into that. You know, we talk about gut feelings and I feel it in my heart. Those are all real. And so when people are experiencing these types of symptoms, they are real and they need to be addressed at all these various levels. Well, thank you. So, uh, uh, John, any any further things from you? Uh, no, I'm just, you know, I'm, it's something that before the Vietnam War, you know, they call it shell shock right. after World War II. And here we are uh, 50 years later or so, and um, we're recognizing that this is a bigger problem at, at various levels in society uh, than just, you know, war and uh, reaction to battle. So uh, I think it's an important topic. It's not going away, and we all need to learn more about it. So Dr. Liz, thank you so much. You're welcome. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.